there's a lot of dogma out there that if you don't do a 5 a.m. fasted hit training style workout, that you're not actually going to get results when it comes to your exercise. So today's guest is going to help me clear that up and so much more. So stay tuned. Welcome back. My name is Sarah. This is the Sarah Kleiner Wellness YouTube channel. Thank you so much for being here. Today's guest is a friend of mine. We actually did work together personally about five years ago. His name is Rob Jacobs. Now I'm going to really encourage you to follow him on social media as well as check out the website that I have linked for him. If you're looking for a consultation or to learn more from Rob, please do follow those links again down in the show notes for you. He is a wealth of information. Charles Poliquin, if you don't know who that is, definitely look him up, named Rob one of his top 100 coaches before he passed away a few years ago. So that is a high, high honor and means that Rob is top caliber. I think he's absolutely brilliant and a world-class person and has so much great information to share. In this episode, we're really gonna try to clear up a lot of information around exercise, how to figure out what time to do it, what's best for you based on your current stress levels and your goals. Do you want to lose weight? Are you a stressed out person who already has a lot going on? How should you approach exercise and also diet as well? Now, Rob and I, again, we worked together about five years ago and reconnected in the last year over circadian health and quantum biology. He is very well versed on both of those things, which is another reason I wanted to bring him onto the show today to talk about that. So make sure that you check out the show notes where we have everything timestamped so you can skip ahead through the episode, go back and listen to topics again down in the show notes. Also speaking of timestamps, thank you to my two sponsors. The first one is going to be Viva Rays. We talk a ton about the importance of circadian health in this episode. And the way that I protect my circadian rhythms is actually using the Viva Rays glasses in the morning, in the evening, and when I'm under artificial light. You can use my code YOGI to save 15% over at Viva Rays and they will take your prescription as well. So again, check that link out down in the show notes. Second sponsor of today's episode is going to be Upgraded Formulas. You can use my code YOGI12 or YOGI to save over at Upgraded Formulas. They are my go-to source for a hair tissue mineral analysis with a consultation. Now, a blood test is only going to show you what's going on immediately. A hair tissue mineral analysis can show you what's been going on in the last 60 to 90 days. So you can actually take a much more targeted approach to balancing your minerals. So check them out again, link down in my show notes and let's jump into today's episode. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the show. I'm really excited to have today's guest here. Now, I actually met Rob about five years ago, I think it was, and did some training with him and was the first person that when we approached my personal training, it was a little bit different than the way that a lot of other trainers approach things. And you can see his shirt there. Um, he has a different lens of the way he looks at exercise. So I'm excited to dive into a lot of these topics. Thank you so much for being here, Rob. Yeah. Thanks for having me. I'm excited. It's good to see you again. Yeah. It's good to see you too. We, I mean, we both live in Atlanta, but it's, it's such a big city and we both live such busy lives that <laughs> You can live close to one another and then not see each other for years. So it's, it's good to, to reconnect. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Well, let's, let's talk a little bit about your background before we jump into some of those topics I emailed you about. Okay. Yeah. Oh, so want, tell me, how, me to just go? Yeah, Sorry. yeah, just go. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I've been a strength and conditioning coach for 23, 24 years now. Um, you know, started a long time ago, um, started working with high school athletes, track and field, baseball, basketball, doing all that stuff. Um, and then eventually started uh, honing in on uh, combine testing for the NFL. So I spent four or five years really focused on that and track and field, uh, basically teaching guys how to uh, biomechanically beat the tests, uh, not so much strength, but track and field techniques and, and that sort of thing to make everybody faster. And uh, then got into MMA. So I did that for another 10 or 15 years and uh, started competing in strongman and have since worked with bodybuilders, bikini competitors of that 
nature and competitive strongman. Um, and uh, now I am teaching and coaching coaches more than, than anything. And you are really closely connected with Charles Paulson, correct? I was, yeah. Uh, unfortunately, yeah. Charles passed away a few years ago. Uh, geez, it's been a while now. Um, it has, I remember I was at the gym when that actually happened. Um, so it had to have been about five years ago, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I was uh, fortunate enough to be able to call Charles a friend um which which is a really really cool thing i was actually his last private client um so i i in addition to being friends with him i got to work with him you know personally as as my coach uh one-on-one -on -one for the last three or four years before he passed um so he he was coaching me for competitions which was an incredibly uh valuable experience before that you know i had been a, a student of charles's for probably 10 years maybe a little longer than that and then finally weaseled my way into the, uh, to the inner circle and uh, got to spend a lot of time with him as a friend and then even more time with him as a student after that. Yeah. And he's a lot of biohackers talk about Paul Quinn and, and his methods. They're, they're, they're very different to when you look at, you know, your, your typical personal training models. And I remember yeah. when I was working with you in particular, that he actually named you one of his top coaches ever, which is <laughs> yeah, like, Huge, 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 huge. Yeah. That was, that was a career highlight. I remember when he sent me the message uh, that he was going to put me on the list. That was a really, literally, I know it sounds kind of silly, but that's probably the, the best thing that's happened to me, like as a personal reward, you know, in my, my career so far. Cause for a lot of us, uh, like for people that don't know Charles, the guy was so good, literally like 40 years ahead of, of all of his contemporaries for the most part, you know, so you spend your, you know, I guess like most students with their mentors, you, you spend the majority of your career just like wanting to get their approval and for them to be like, oh yeah, that guy's good, you know, or that guy knows what's up. Uh, and, and that list that he put out before he passed away was, uh, was, a, was a pretty cr crowning achievement for a lot of us. There's a lot of, a lot of big name coaches on that list. Yeah, I, I remember that. And, you know, just for anybody who's not really familiar with, with his work and kind of how he approaches fitness, what makes his approach so different than what you're typically going to see out there with coaches and, and trainers? So a lot of what, what Charles brought to the forefront, and it's interesting, he, he brought so many things so long ago, a lot of people don't even know, you know, some of his contributions, but with him and learning from him, one of the biggest differences that I noticed right away was the amount of detail. Um, you know, there's your timing, your rest, your, you're just tracking everything in general. You know, I've worked at so many facilities where uh, a coach or a trainer will just like scribble their workout down on a whiteboard randomly before the session. Um, you know, so there, there's lots of things like that. But some of the big things that Charles brought that people might be familiar with is uh, tempo is one of the one of the first things that he introduced. And that's, you know, basically every ounce or every position of of a particular rep has a controlled speed so that, you know, every as a coach so that every rep is identical. Um, you know, so I, I just kind of give people perspective, right? If you do 10 reps at a one zero one zero tempo, or right, that's 20 seconds. If you do 10 reps at a four zero one zero tempo, that's 50 seconds. So there's a substantial difference in what happens when you're lifting 20 seconds versus 50 seconds and, and additionally how much weight you can lift. So that was one of the big things that he popularized in the numbering system for that. And uh, the other big one was actually just the, the superset. Um, you know, doing two exercises back to back or doing chest and back, you know, back to back was, was one of the things that he was really one of the first people to do uh, before he wrote about that kind of thing in the early eighties. You know, most people just did one exercise and did it till they finished it and then did the next one and then did the next one. And with all these time and efficiency, you know, hacks that Charles came up with, that was a, a big one because basically he found out that you could rest half as long as you as your system truly needed to is if you did, you know, the, the opposing muscle group. So if you did a, a biceps curl rest and then did a triceps exercise to, for the system to maximally recover, that's like up to five minutes, depending on, you know, how heavy you're lifting. And if you pair that with the, the opposing muscle, you can cut your rest time in half or, or even more than in half. And that really speeds up the efficiency of the system. And, and one of the other things, you know, that Charles brought in was the hormonal component of training. 
And he was one of the first guys, you know, that's like, Hey, if you train more than 45 minutes or so, you know, 60 minutes, you're, once you hit that mark, you're actually doing more harm than good hormonally. So like get in, get out, get jacked and be done with it. Um, Cause you know, previous to that, like the, the majority of the exposure is, is bodybuilding and Olympic weightlifting. And those guys are in the gym, you know, two hours sometimes, um, you know, or most of them are on drugs so they can handle it. But you know, that bleeds into the, the non-drugged uh, lifters, but that was a, a huge, a huge component that he was one of the, one of the first guys to actually write about and, and make popular is that, Hey, there's, there's a hormonal effect. If you lift a certain way, or if you rest a certain amount of time, you get a different hormonal response. Uh, and, and he was, you know, one of the first guys that was talking about that. Yeah. And I think that's, that's something that a lot of my listeners, viewers are going to be interested in, in talking more about. Um, I also want to talk a little bit about the, you know, when, when you trained me, you had me take this extensive test about neurotransmitters, which I just found absolutely fascinating. And this is another smart way that, that you train people. And I know you're teaching coaches how to do this. Can we dive into that before we jump into the hormonal aspect a little bit more? Yeah, sure. So, so Charles started using uh, a, a personality assessment called the Braverman test to, uh, you know, assess your personality trait, um, uh, your personality traits and qualities. And so that test provides us uh, with your, your personality dominances and deficiencies in terms of neurotransmitters. So, I mean, people have heard dopamine a ton and serotonin a lot, but there's a few others uh, like acetylcholine and um, and GABA that don't really get a lot of press, uh, but those are those are all super important components of training because your your personality traits and personality type is, is not only dictates what you enjoy, but it does also affect your your biochemistry in certain in certain ways, right? Like your if you have more fast twitch muscle fibers, that is generally made up of a bit more dopamine and that the dopamine content, uh, you know, essentially bleeds into your personality and those types of athletes or those types of clients enjoy certain types of training more than, than others. And when you can tap into what a client really thrives on essentially is what the, the whole idea is. You get better results and you get results faster. You know, I, like one of, um, the guy I work for, David Lawrence, right now, his his gym's tagline is three years of results in three months. And essentially that that's what happened when I started learning from Charles is, you know, pretty much anything you do exercise wise will get you results. You know, like it's really hard not to get a positive outcome in some form or fashion. But as a coach where it gets important is if I can get you results faster than the guy down the street or, you know, faster than somebody that's my competition that's way better for me. And honestly, it's way better for you in the long run, provided that those are sustainable results. But when we're talking about athletics, you know, performance and sustainability don't always, don't always jive. Um, but the, you know, so the neurotransmitter thing is great because it, it, it allows us to, to see what you thrive on. It, it can help us with communication. So communicating with the client, knowing how they're going to respond, uh, the deficiencies provide us with insight into you know, how well you're going to recover from high intensity workouts. Um, and so in the strength and conditioning field, intensity is a function of uh, weight and effort. And I know a lot of people are, are familiar with a high intensity session, like a boot camp style body weight workout, but in, in sports science, intensity is a, is a percentage of your one rep max. So some of those levels of the neurotransmitters tell us, you know, okay, person A can respond and recover really well from heavy, high intensity training. Whereas person B is lacking this neurotransmitter or that neurotransmitter, they're not going to recover from that as well. So we've got to you know, pull back on their sets as they progress. Whereas the other person, you can actually add sets to them. They don't need as much time to recover. So there's a lot of those aspects. There's some nutritional things. Uh, and then after getting into some of the circadian side of things, you can actually extrapolate a little bit of what's going on uh, with somebody's kind of circadian environment, so to speak, with some of the dopamine levels and some of the serotonin levels and things like that, knowing a little bit of what their environmental exposures and their habits might be like. Yeah, that's the one question I was going to ask is once you kind of drill things down to see, I remember I was acetylcholine dominant, I think. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. 
but do that, does that ever change once you help someone understand circadian lifestyle, circadian habits, the importance of light? Does that change or does it shift the way you do things? I'm curious about that. So, you know, mostly what, what we look at to see changes in are the deficiencies. So when you, when you get to a, you know, like a written test like this, there's definitely some bias that occurs because, you know, like with, with dopamine, for example, that's heavyweight low reps and, you know, everybody wants to be special in some form or fashion, but that's generally doing less reps is generally what everyone wants to do. You know, even people that love training would love to not need to do more reps if the test told them that was the case. Right. So one of the things that we kind of have to take a pretty hard stance on is not really retaking the test once somebody's done it. So they don't, you know, because you do start to answer those questions differently, but on the deficiencies end, that's one that I will have people retake uh, depending on how big some of those deficiencies are, because I want to see if what we are doing is changing um, because that won't necessarily affect the way in which I train you. It'll affect some of the nutritional, um, nutritional interventions, some of the supplement interventions. It'll affect how you recover from, from training. Uh, so it tells me how hard I can push you a little bit more, but that tends to be what we look at more so we don't start to get any you know, confirmational bias or, or any sort of um, inaccuracy to the test because it is, a, you know, it is a psychological trait evaluation. So if you did it too often, eventually somebody's going to start to realize if I say yes to this dopamine section more, he's going to tell me I don't have to do you know, 12 reps anymore. I'll only have to do three or four. <laughs> Right. Um, you know, which does happen. Like I've, I've, I've witnessed it happen, uh, you know, many times. So that's one of the things that we don't really look at because you're the dominances of your personality don't really change in terms of the way the test is, is driven or the way the test is geared. Whereas some of those deficiencies, you know, if somebody is, is severely lacking in serotonin, the, de- the signs of being deficient in that, you know, are, are going to be much more, uh, they're going to change way more than, than what your personality dominance is. If you're dominant in serotonin, you know, you're not really going to see somebody dominant in dopamine change in terms of those personality traits. Um, you know, if you, if they're deficient in something, their odds are they're still going to be dominant in it years and years from now, because that's not how it'll really change. But the deficiency side is definitely uh, can definitely be adjusted and and monitored and worked with, I think. And that's, that's really where that stuff comes in, right? Like if you're, if you're super deficient in dopamine, like, all right, well, are you ever seeing the sunrise? You know, oh, you're def- deficient in serotonin. Do you ever see the sunrise? So we can, that's something that we can change. Whereas if you're, you know, dopamine dominant, that's not really something that's going to be modified if we're changing habits and, and that sort of thing. Got it. So when did you start kind of understanding the importance of circadian rhythms when it comes to training and and adding these like specific strategies in with people? So uh, I've been on to the circadian thing for, I think it's probably since 2015 or 2016. Um, it's just, it's so new, you know, I mean, it didn't, what didn't win the Nobel prize till like 2016, I think. Yeah. Um, but through Charles, there's a large part of Chinese medicine. Uh, that is incorporated uh, actually as far as the neurotransmitter thing goes I believe he started incorporating that via Chinese medicine and and the wood types and fire types and all that was how he first sort of stumbled upon it so there was a large component of that you know with the there's a Chinese medicine clock was this, which is essentially your circadian organ rhythms mm-hmm. right like, and Charles was talking about all that stuff in the 80s you know, like that's been around forever but nobody really tied in, you know, the fact that, oh, well, that's circadian biology, uh, you know, so we've, we've been using a lot of these tools that a lot of people laughed at us for using because, oh, there's no research for that. There's no science for that. You know, again, this, Charles was talking about this in the eighties. Um, you know, most well, Huberman didn't come along talking about this till what, you know, a few years ago, right? Exactly. Uh, yeah. Now that Huberman talks that. about it, people will actually <laughs> listen to it, but yeah. <laughs> Exactly. You yeah, talked about some yeah. of this stuff, you know, in the early 2000s, people thought you were an idiot. So, so it's been a, anyway, to answer your question, it's been a bit of a long road trying to 
to start to, to meld these things together because the more we're learning research wise with circadian biology, the more we're the more we can actually extrapolate from what we were doing with Chinese medicine. And it and it has a much more you know scientific background. Like the meridians, right, for example, is is mm -hmm. like directional electron flow. Like that's pretty cool. Now knowing that we can actually take some of the meridian system stuff and and get a lot more mileage out of some of that, you know, and it's the same sort of thing with the, with the circadian system is now we can, we can take that Chinese medicine organ clock and sleep disturbances and all these things and really hone in on that to be, you know, oh, if you just program the sunrise, you can actually manipulate that clock to what it's supposed to be doing. So with that, you know, and that's one of those things where that, as that circadian research starts to give us a little bit more ammunition, we can really take some of that, that cool stuff from Chinese medicine and put it into practice with a lot more efficiency and effect, uh, effectiveness. Yeah, that's, it's super fascinating how that interplays with things. And one of my good friends is actually uh, pretty closely connected with Dr. Cruz and he's a Chinese medicine doctor. And so talking about this different electron flow and talking about different timing of organs and how all these things are super connected. I think that we, we almost can't have a conversation about nutrition or exercise without bringing these things in. But I think it, it's, it's really, really missing um, for a lot of people. And, you know, a lot of my kind of quantum friends, practitioners, they will say, you know, no exercising under blue lights, you know, don't go in the gym and exercise under blue lights. So how do you kind of circumvent that? Because I know you still have to work in a gym to get access to all the great equipment that you have. Like, how do you help that for yourself and for your athletes as well? Yeah. And, you know, I mean, if, if we could work out at Gold's Gym on Venice Beach, you know, that would probably be oh, yeah. you know, <laughs> the ultimate experience. Um, but, you know, if you've got a guy who uh, plays wide receiver for the Miami Dolphins and you need to get 10% body fat off of him in six weeks and he'll make another $3 million, blue light in the gym isn't factoring into the equation a ton. You know, so, right. uh, so like, that's a lot of one of those things where performance and longevity and, and some of these things don't really go hand in hand. However, there are, you know, there's lots of things that you can do to, to mitigate that. You can have red light around you when you train, you can make sure that you are in fact, seeing the sunrise and seeing the sunset and mitigating the blue light when you're not in the gym and, and diminishing that, you know, so there, there's, it's not that any of those people are wrong. I've, I agree and believe in that a thousand percent. However, you know, there's only so many, so many things you can do. And, you know, I've, I've made my business being in the gym, so I'm, <laughs> I'm not going to take it out, take it out of the gym. Uh, because also depending on where you live, uh, you know, you're, if I made everyone work out and uh, three weeks ago, I probably wouldn't have been making any money. You know, it was freezing here. Oh and, yeah. And with, you know, the rain and everything. So, you know, I think working out outside is fantastic. I think working out outside with weights would probably be my ultimate experience. I'm actually trying to figure out how I can build a gym in my backyard here to, yeah. to, accom to accommodate that and, and do all that at home. Uh, you know, but it's, it's difficult. So that's one of those things that's not an easy adjustment. But, you know, you can, uh, most gyms have loading bay doors, right? So, you know, you can turn some of the lights off. You can open those bay doors. And, and kill some of those overhead lights and get as much sunlight in as you can. And that's the, that's the main way that I have to try to mitigate it at the gyms that I'm at is get those bay doors open as often as possible. If you have a, you know, a lot of people will have places outdoors where they can do prowler pushes and sprints and strong man work as we call it. Uh, and we'll do that as much as possible, you know? Um, so, you know, get outside as much as you can, but you know, there's a lot of, a lot of healthy people have been working out indoors for a long time. So I think as far as uh, low hanging fruit, that's not high on the list. Yeah. I mean, what I've been telling people is it's better to work out than to not most of the time, unless you're really in a, in a terrible hormonal situation. And then you really want to modify that you work out the way that you move, which we can probably dive into that a little bit. But, you know, I think some people, get so hyper focused on doing everything perfectly that they do this, you know, paralysis by analysis thing. Right. And I think working out has kind of fallen into that category for a lot of people because it's it does take extra motivation to to work out and and to train. Um and so if someone's saying, oh, don't go under the blue light, it's bad for you. 
um, maybe having a little bit more of a nuanced conversation about your morning routine, getting sunrise, getting UVA, taking light breaks, you know, getting that rhythm going throughout the day, because we all do live in a modern world and we all are going to be exposed to blue light and non-native EMF. And that's just kind of, that's what it's like to be a modern human. But when you can do things like what I'm doing, sitting outdoors, any opportunity that you get, I always say that's kind of like putting money in the bank, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Because there's, there's a lot of other ways, right? Like how many, how many people who work out indoors aren't waking up and getting outside first thing? Right. You know, like I didn't for years <laughs> until I, yeah. until I, you know, until I knew about some of this stuff, my, my outdoor experience was, you know, door to car, car to door. And yep. that, you know, I was an indoor cat for, for the vast majority of my life. And, you know, at, at that point, working out indoors was not my biggest problem. So I, I right. think you're right. It's like, it's one of those things where, yeah, you're right. That's, you know, there's more singlet oxygen free radicals when you're working out under blue light and all this stuff. And, but again, there's, and it depends on what your purpose is, right? If you, if you right. don't care, if you're not on stage competing and you just want right. to exercise, you know, you can go to the park and, and like, there's a weird little park gym, you know, across the street from my house that has, um, some sort of like rowing thing and push-up bars and dip bars and pull-up bar, like all kinds of stuff, you know, where like if your livelihood isn't based off of needing to be in the gym, then you don't need to be in the gym. Like it's not that big of a deal, right? If you like yeah. to exercise, go to the gym. But if not, going for a walk, do some sprints outside, that's phenomenal exercise. But again, like if I, you know, football player comes to me in the middle of December and I got six weeks or you know, whatever, whatever sport, right? That's right. mid football, but yeah, there, there, there's a lot of instances where like, okay, well, we have to be in the gym. You need, you need a stronger bench press and you'll make more money. We're, you know, we're going to be in the gym. Right. You know, so, right, right. but again, for the, like I said, for the average person, like if you, you know, if it was you and all you were doing was yoga, right. you, don't need it, you don't need gym for that, you know, go outside. Yeah. That'd be, that'd be fantastic. So it has its, it, it has a time and a place, you know, and it's the same thing with a lot of supplements, right? Like, I don't think vitamin D should be supplemented by damn near anybody, but there are instances where that could be a useful supplement for a given amount of time to help yeah. a specific reason. And you shouldn't, you know, you shouldn't throw the baby out with the bathwater just because most people don't need it. I agree. I totally agree. I, I don't really like to speak in absolutes anymore, just because yeah. if the amount of people that I've talked to and then, you know, from the professional side, but then when you actually talk to the people that are listening to the podcast, listening to this content, you're all, you're always going to find somebody that is, you know, some sort of an anomaly that maybe yeah. there is an instance where something would be appropriate that some expert has said never, do, you know, so there's, I, I like to always throw that caveat out there with, with any topic, you know? Yeah, um, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And so I guess the one thing I wanted to talk about was, all right, so circadian timing with exercise there, there's a lot of talk about this. And this is another one where I'm like, you know, if you can strength train period, I think it's better than trying to do it at a specifically like perfect time. Um, but if there was a, a great time for exercise on a circadian schedule, what would you say that would look like? So it changes kind of as the day goes. Um, what we know right now is that the morning time tends to be the best time to do metabolic work. Um, and mostly where a lot of this stuff comes from is the system's response to exercise. So when we look at when you exercise in the morning, there's an upregulation of branched chain amino acid catabolism. There's an upregulation of uh, production of um, uh, keto, like uh, of ketosis, essentially, right? You're making more of those. You're making more of the genes that um, that convert amino acids into ketogenic amino acids. There's a whole host of those types of interactions that happen when you exercise in the early phase of the circadian cycle, which sort of means that would be the best time to do metabolic fat loss type of training, right? You're not, you don't need yeah. a lot of carbs for that. It'll help you get super lean. Whereas if you're working out in the evening you see an increase in, uh, in the TCA cycle and in carbohydrate metabolism. And evening exercise tends to make you a bit more carb tolerant in the evening post-exercise. So 
that leads itself to a, a specific type of training, more muscle building, right? You, you don't need carbohydrates for metabolic work. They help you with strength a little bit and definitely help you with putting on size. So that's kind of how I fall into thinking this type of training should go here. This type of training should go there just based on what happens in general with a, with a baseline form of exercise. Um, but, you know, again, if I, if I got a shot putter that needs to train for the Olympics, and they can only train at 6 a.m. and they need maximum power work. Sorry, we're going to train maximum power, right? That's all we can do. Um, right. You know, so again, it's one of those things like we said earlier, don't, don't let that deter you from doing your metabolic fat loss work if you can only train at 6 p.m. But what that tells you is that if you're training at 6 p.m., you can probably handle a little bit more carbohydrates than the person training at 6 a.m. or mm -hmm. 8 a.m. or whatever, just because those reactions are happening in the mitochondria as a result of exercise at that time. Got it. Yeah, I think that that's one conversation that that can get really confusing for people is, you know, different types of exercise, different times of day, different types of diets, like what's best for one person may not be best for another person. Um, let's just take my average listener, probably female between the ages of 35 and 50. Um, let's say she hasn't worked out in a really long time. Uh, and wants to, all right, here we are in January, wants to kind of look at getting back in shape. What would you recommend for someone like that versus, I know you deal with a lot of, you know, high level athletes and <laughs> professional athletes. What would you recommend for this type of person that maybe wanted to lose 20, 30 pounds versus a, a professional athlete as, as far as timing goes, type of exercise, all that kind of thing? So, uh, you know, if, if anyone could work out anytime they wanted, I feel like mid morning after breakfast is generally when mm -hmm. most people feel like if they had to, they would. Um, now there's, you know, there's a lot of good research that say some men make more testosterone at 7 PM. Some men make more testosterone at 7 AM. You know, you can, you can look for research to support your point of view and find it for damn near anything. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that that's another reason I really like to default to the circadian stuff because those systems all work the same. Yes. Whereas your hormone production can be modulated by something you've done that doesn't have anything to do with when you're exercising. So, you know, in an ideal world, right, you would wake up, you'd see at sunrise, you'd go in, you'd, you'd eat your breakfast an hour or so later, you'd go exercise and then you'd go on, you know, about your day. Uh, so hopefully that's what people can do. But generally speaking, it either has to be before work or after work. Mm -hmm. for most people, you know, and, yep. and if that's the case, I would say working out after work is probably going to be way more productive than working out before work in the dark, before the sun rises, you know, you mm -hmm. can, you can make it work. I, I obviously that, again, that's another one of those things where I, a lot of the coaches I work with have to wake up at 4 AM oh, and, gosh. you know, like, all right, well, this guy's never seen the sunrise. So what can we do right. for this person? Right. Because it's just, it's not going to happen. They're not going to move right. to you know, El Salvador, <laughs> right? There. Right. I know like some of my friends, I'm like shirt off in the jungle. I get it. But like most people can't do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And you like, if you're going to help more people, you need to have an answer for that because you can't, yes. help them, right? Like, so, uh, so sunrise breakfast training would be, would be what I would, would recommend. I think that's the best way to go. And, and for, you know, for that particular type of female, they often shy away from strength training. And I know that's one of the things mm -hmm. that, that we spent most of our time doing because, mm -hmm. you know, I know you said all oh, you, you only work with athletes, but the organism is still roughly the same for, for everyone. Right. And one of the things that I really like to, to try to encourage females to do is the stronger you are, the faster you can get leaner, mm -hmm. which, which is one thing that really, I, I think doesn't register. It doesn't make sense. Right. Because so if you think about it in terms of actually like sets and reps and everything, right. If, if, if day one, I ask you to do the hardest effort, 10 reps you could possibly do, and you can only lift 50 pounds. But if you're a stronger person and, and that 50 pounds is 80 or 90, instead of 50, that person will be, will be better sooner than the other person because they can do more work, right. They can put more of a demand on the organism, it'll adapt faster and you'll see bigger changes. So that's one of the things that we have to do a lot of the times is you're actually not really strong enough to do some, some tasks that we need you to do. So we're going to spend some time doing strength training and hit some basic strength goals 
then we'll get you super lean because now you're, you don't actually have to work as hard. Uh, right. And that, that's the a big difference between lifting weights and some of the just doing cardiovascular work mm -hmm. is, you know, uh, one of the sayings in, in my field is that strength is the mother of all qualities. And it really is because there's, there's no physical quality that strength will not improve. Mm -hmm. So if you improve strength, everything gets better. Whereas if you just improve hypertrophy, everything doesn't change. If you just improve your metabolic conditioning, everything doesn't change. But if you get stronger, you've put a, an adaptation into the organism that improves all of its outcomes, whatever you ask it to do. Yeah. And I think that's a really tough one for a lot of women to get on board with, because a lot of the women that come to me, they're, they have kids, they have busy lives. And so they're getting up at 5am before everybody else. And they're doing high intensity interval training, you know, which is very like cardio based. And a lot of them can't lose weight to save their lives. Their cortisol patterns are a complete mess. Um, and it's, you know, it's hard to get them to understand, like, to, number one, you probably need to stop doing that for a while um, and, and, and switch things up. So what would you say to, to women who are kind of doing that? What would be a helpful thing for them to do to kind of get back on track? Yeah. So, um, so making that switch, right. I, I know you probably talk about mitochondria a ton on here. Mm -hmm. So uh, as far as training adaptations to the mitochondria, right, we have uh, fission and fusion. So one of those is making, you know, more splitting mitochondria and having more. The other one is merging and, and having less, right. And your training uh, modality dictates which one of those happens. So if you are a, a dysfunctional being and you do high intensity cardiovascular work, that actually induces fission, which makes more defective mitochondria. Mm. It, it's more work to repair them, right? So you're yep. actually not helping the system that much. Right. Whereas if you did strength training, that it elicits more of a fusion response. So you're increasing mitochondrial density because they're getting bigger, right? But it's easier to repair one mitochondria than it is 10 to 15. Right. So that's kind of one of those weird places we have to start is, is we need to repair your mitochondria first, right? If you're, if you're super dysfunctional, uh, one of my, my colleagues likes to say least mode to beast mode, you know, and yeah. we're really for a lot of people, you know, like you don't, you don't need hit. You just no. need to walk for 30 minutes, mm -hmm. a couple of times a week to, you know, repair some of these defective mitochondria so that they're not broken. Mm -hmm. And then yeah. we can do things like hit and hard strength work and fat loss training with, you know, non-dysfunctional mitochondria first. Right. So that it's, it's, I know it's really, even knowing the science behind it, it's still a bit hard to kind of wrap my head around some of these things that are a little different than what we've always, you know, been told. Cause like in, in performance, right. Uh, the aerobic base is, is one of the things that we're, we're always taught and it's, and it's kind of bullshit because we know how the Soviets came up with it and, it and it was a bit of a flawed concept initially. But when we look at mitochondrial biogenesis wise with fusion and fusion, you know, if you're doing one form of training, like I said, you're going to multiply those mitochondria. And if they don't work well to begin with, you're not right. doing yourself any favors. Right. But, you know, if you can get those fusion responses from slower steady state, non-metabolic work, which, which are also some of the adaptations that comes from strength training and hypertrophy training. Yeah. You can, you can give the system the ability to repair those things, you know, with, um, with PGC one alpha and all those things that happen in, you know, in the mitochondria that, that elicit repair rather than doing this, just gut busting work at 4 AM mm -hmm. before your kids wake up, you know, you actually don't right. need to work as hard yet. Yeah, I think that's a really tough one for women, especially because we're told if you're not working out hard, you're not sweating, you're not putting in all this effort, then you're not going to lose the weight. And, you know, personally for me, when I was on my fertility journey, I also had about 20 extra pounds I wanted to lose that just wasn't going anywhere. And I was like, well, I'm 41. So I guess that's kind of normal for that age. Um, and what I did was I just walked. That's it. I walked and I did my left and reset program where I'm doing sunrise. I'm getting sunlight. I'm kind of taking it easy and going on that more mitochondrial repair type of, you know, yeah. mitigating non-native EMF, mitigating light, all of those things. And just kind of getting my body to come out of that 
majorly stressed out mode. And it was right about day 30 that the weight just started falling off of me. And I ended up losing 30 pounds that second month, still with just walking outdoors, you know, and doing mitochondrial repair work. I ended up before getting pregnant, starting to go back to strength training in a moderate way, nothing crazy, nothing at 5 a.m. in the middle of the day, just doing strength training. But that's not how I lost the weight. I was able to lose the weight by kind of backing out of it a little bit. And, and I think that's just such a hard oh, yeah. leap for people to make because they just, they're so conditioned to think that if they're not working hard, they're not going to lose the weight. But yeah. yeah. And, and recovery is a huge, huge part of that problem, right? As you, you get, you get the moms that will do this at four, four thirty, five 5.00 AM. Yeah. But then they, then they have to go live the life of a mom, which is right. not easy, right? Like right. there's not a lot of, you know, easy recovery time in that day, mm-hmm. sometimes mm-hmm. ever. And so one of the, like, one of the things that, that, that I always say is that growth only happens at the rate of restoration. Mm-hmm. And when you look at successful bikini competitors, bodybuilders, athletes, whoever it is, right? Like, especially if we look at pro athletes, the right. most successful ones invest more into their recovery red light therapy now and all these modalities and massage and all this stuff than they do into their training. And, and that's, that's a huge issue more, more so with females uh, yep. be, because it involves things like actually eating more and, mm-hmm. and eating things like more protein mm-hmm. and having maybe a protein shake. If you're not going to allow yourself an actual meal, like you, you're going to do this demanding exercise and not give your body the fuel it requires to recover from that. Right. And right. everybody's afraid of getting bulky, but it, it's not even that, you know, it's, <laughs> you go do a hit workout, you need, you just earned a protein shake. You, you've got to put gas in the tank. Otherwise right. the, you're going to break down eventually. And, and that's a, anyone I've ever seen that didn't get results, even seeing people train with coaches with shitty programs, it's a recovery problem, right? Because mm-hmm. the, the worst of the worst of the worst of programs will, will yield a positive result if you're recovering. Yeah. The, that's the, you know, the, the organism just adapts to those uh, stressful stimuli, but you know, when you're going to wake up and train at inopportune times, but it's the best you can do, you have to, you have to feed the machine so that it can recover. Right. Yeah. And what that looks like, I think for a lot of women, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but that lack of recovery turns up to be inflammation, dysregulated cortisol patterns, weight that you just cannot lose and essentially leptin resistance, right? Would you say? Yeah, absolutely. Well, so we know what leptin resistance is always going to precede insulin resistance. Exactly. How many, how many of these people that can't lose weight are clinically insulin resistant? Right. The overwhelming majority. So if we can start to address the root cause of these problems with things like tackling leptin and, and really getting a hold of what can modulate that, you're just going to, you, these, I see it all the time. It's, it's so sad. People just dig themselves a hole yep. and eventually get into some sort of burnout. You know, like yeah. the, ladies will train a way their, their menses and they'll train their hormones. So, you know, uh, like bikini competitors in particular, oh, right? they, oh, yeah. they have to train in such a way their hormones become as messed up as a man's hormones do using anabolic steroids. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it's it, without using all the drugs, like, so, so ladies have it even harder than, than men in this regard, because they can just drive their hormones into the gutter. And, mm-hmm. you know, like we, we've heard so much about how fat is bad, and how like mm-hmm. apparently meat is bad now, right? It's right. Bad for everything. But right. We have to make these hormones from something. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we know what that raw material is, right? Right. Um, Right. And, and it's the foods that everyone is so, have been so ingrained to be scared to eat because they might yep. gain a little weight. And yep. like, I'm, you know, I'm sorry if, if you could see the amounts of food that the leanest people on earth eat at certain points, right. A lot of them starve themselves for some reason, but, mm-hmm. but to give you a good example, the last female uh, bikini competitor that I put on stage was eating, I think 20 between 18 and 2,200 calories the week she stepped on stage. Wow. Right. That's and my, a lot. <laughs> my, my guys will eat, you know, almost twice that the week they step on stage. 
and wow. their, you know, their existence is predicated upon being as lean as humanly possible. Right. So that's what I, I, you know, I try to use that example. You know, it's like, I know you don't want to be bulky, but you want to be lean. You see how right. lean these, these people are, right? Uh, you can get that lean uh, eating a lot of food. Yep. I think it comes down to the healthy of, of the mitochondria. And that's what I try to drive home with people is like, that's the energy management system of your body. You know, if you think you have a slow metabolism or you, you know, can't lose weight to save your life, there's probably a level of leptin resistance and mitochondrial dysfunction at play. And instead of working out harder at 5 a.m. more often, cutting calories more, you're going to drive, if you do that, you're going to drive yourself deeper into mitochondrial dysfunction, deeper into leptin resistance. So you have to back out of that a little bit. And that was one of the things that you, I mean, even back in two, it was 2017, I think when you were training me, um, I remember the Bulletproof book had just come out and I was yeah. like, Rob, I'm, <laughs> I'm not going to eat until one o'clock. I'm just going to have Bulletproof coffee <laughs> in the mornings. And then I completely tanked out and started gaining weight. I was like, okay, this is the first time in my life. And I think I was closer to 39 or so at that point first time in my life that I was eating less and trying to do this bulletproof coffee until one o'clock in the afternoon and workout where I actually saw my body get more puffy, more inflamed and yeah. gain weight, you know, and I, I, it's so counterintuitive, um, because everyone's so much energy in, energy out, but <laughs> <laughs> right. yeah, seeing, yeah. seeing people get lean. Uh, so, you know, it's this weird dichotomy where if you're, if you've, if you're feeding the machine enough fuel it can work harder right and if you feed it good fuel it will work harder more efficiently and that usually leads to the outcomes you're trying to accomplish yeah yeah and instead of putting yourself into starvation survival mode right your body's going to hang on to all that stuff or it's going to start eating muscle to create these amino acids since you're not eating any protein but there's all right. sorts of these these bad things that can happen that some of these myths just, and there's no, really no good rationale to, to these things. And like we get into hormones and all that stuff, right? All that's made in the mitochondria, everything, the buck right. stops with the mitochondria, right? That's, that is the like single most important part of, of human physiology. Exactly. So somebody that comes to you, maybe that's completely in this hormonal deficit, how do you help them dig out of that? What are the basic things that you look at for those people so the the daily routines are are one of the first places we start right obviously sleep we start there because generally if we can improve sleep we can improve the morning routines and then if we can improve the morning routine with sunrise and then we can actually continue to improve sleep um, so generally that and and we start with a bit of a, of a dietary intake, we can look at blood work and labs and, and, and all that stuff and really get into what the actual root cause of the problem is. But mm -hmm. honestly, most of the time we are actually telling people to eat more food. It's just different types of food. Mm -hmm. You know, when, when I tell a 130 pound female that she needs to be eating 150 grams of protein every day, <laughs> that's a bit of a, <laughs> a bit of a shock, you know? Um, yeah. But it's like, you know, if you, if you've ever played a video game and created a character on a video game, you can't take all the attribute dials up to, to top end, right? And only, you only get so many like points and you raise up protein, you bring down carbs or fats, or you raise up right. fats, you bring protein down a little bit. What, you know, it's, and what I really like about trying to do this with the seasons is it actually builds in a cyclical change in your diet where we're going to eat yes. a little bit more fat here. We're going to eat a little bit more protein here. Now we're going to eat a little bit more fruit, but more carbohydrates. And then that's yep. going to change changing your training with all that too, because there's really, I was fortunate enough a few years ago to have uh, the, the female I just mentioned that I was eating so many calories, had a, a show, um, it was before Christmas, I can't remember exactly, it's probably November, but one of the things that we did was a seasonal diet with her and used cold exposure, cold thermogenesis and everything to, to help her deal with eating less than, you know, 2000 calories. Um, yeah. But when you can really start to, to pair your training also seasonally, right? That's one of the other things that we do is like in the, in the winter time, when you're not supposed to have as many calories, one of the things you can do without having to starve yourself is to change how you train. 
If you mm. do more cardiovascular work, more metabolically demanding work during those winter months, if your calories stay the same all year round, just by changing right. how you train, you're actually eating less. Yeah. You know, so, that, so that's a really yeah. productive way I found, especially with competitors where it really matters to, to take away food. Like one of my, my primary strategy is to actually increase training rather than take away food. Mm. We can go from training once a day to twice a day to three times a day. I can give you more food as we're doing that and actually, you know, decrease your calorie intake just by increasing your, your training, you know, and that uh, those are pretty powerful adjustments. Right. So for an everyday person, maybe that's not like a high performance, you know, bikini competitor athlete, we should be changing the way that we train. Do you think in the winter versus the summer? Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. You know, so like I said, in the, in the winter time, it, because of the nature of, of what's available, right? You, you need a lot of energy to be super strong. You need a lot of food, a lot of certain types of food to put on the most amount of muscle mass. So you, you, know, you start to structure your training with that. So I've got a lot of, of clients that I've trained over 10 years now, and that's the system that we start to build in. So once it starts to get a little cold here, we change our, our food substrates, we change to more metabolic work, and we're, we're going to focus more on weightlifting based cardio. So that's strong man conditioning, you know, things like prowler runs, farmers walks, things that are just, you know, considered cardio. But we'll yep. do that until it starts to get warm, until the food starts to change, you know, because most mm -hmm. of our carbohydrates here in Georgia, I think, gosh, probably until at least February are collard greens and turnip greens. Yeah. Sweet potatoes are in there somewhere, but they usually fall off around February, around January, I think. Right. So, so yeah. we don't need <laughs> if, if that's all I can eat, I should be able to, tr to, to train differently. So and then as those carbohydrates become a little bit more plentiful. Your, your natural training progression anyway is to go from higher repetitions to lower repetitions, right? So we, we start seasonally with that. We have higher repetition-based metabolic work, and then we move to a little bit of hypertrophy work when in the peak of the summer, which is when you want to look your best anyway, right? If you lose mm -hmm. all your weight in the winter, you look yep. good by the time summer rolls around. Right. When summer rolls around, all you're doing is maintaining good body composition, maybe get a little fluffier because you're already lean anyway, start to right. add that body fat for the winter. And as we start to add body fat, it's usually a little easier to get stronger as you start to have a, a more of a surplus of energy, so to speak, right? A surplus of calories. If you want to go that route, it's easier to be stronger when there's, when there's more, uh, more fuel in the tank. So as, right. as we start to roll towards the fall, we're doing a good bit more strength work. And then once it starts to get cold, we shift right back around to, uh, to cardiovascular work. And so that provides a solid framework for training all year long for how your food should change all year long. And people that don't have a competition to train for, or don't have a specific event to train for, have it a little easier in that respect, because you can mm -hmm. stick to what, you know, a natural ebb and flow of things. So right. you're, you're training the same sort of system two to three months or so at a time, which is what we do you know, in program design anyway, is, is programs are based on roughly 12 week cycles. The, the Soviets taught us that's about as far as you can push an organism before you need to back off is about 12 weeks. Um, mm. So if we, if we revolve our training around those three to four month, two month seasonal cycles, it gives you a really great framework. Uh, and you don't have to be beholden to stepping on stage in this month or having the combine in this month or a track meet in this month. You can just flow your training, you know, naturally with, with food availability and, and what you, you know, can or can't do. Yeah. And I feel like that's a missing conversation piece when it comes to nutrition and it comes to, to working out is like ebbing and flowing with the seasons, looking at local seasonal food that's available to you. And I mean, just in my experience, like I'm learning all this stuff now about breast milk now because I'm breastfeeding. And I, what I didn't realize is that it changes throughout the year. You know, there's more fat in it in the winter and there's more water in it in the summer and it changes on a 24 hour cycle too. It's like, there's more cortisol during the day and yeah. more melatonin at night, all these different hormones. And so, you know, we, we get so caught up in like biohacking and, and you know, <laughs> trying to optimize performance that we I think we forget how these natural cycles are supposed to flow with the human body when it comes to optimizing, you know, 
how we look on the outside and, and how we feel in our training, right? Yeah, for sure. And, you know, a lot of that, like a lot of the stuff that we base or most uh, physical fitness information is based on comes from drug using, you know, athletes. Like that's where a lot yeah. of information comes from. And in terms of popular fitness, like dietary information, that's where most of it comes from. You know, a, yep. a, a, a guy and gal who, who ladies use just as much anabolic steroids as men do can, you know, can afford a balanced diet with a decent amount of carbohydrates whenever they want. But, you know, if you're just dealing with playing with the cards you're dealt, you're going to feel a whole lot better changing your diet with the, with the seasonal cycles. Yeah. And then I guess one more question in regards to nutrition and diet. Um, a lot of people that follow me are a little bit more on the low carb keto carnivore end of things. And I, I mean, I personally, when I'm pushing myself super hard training, building muscle, I can't really keep my hormones in a happy place and follow those nutritional strategies. So do you ever layer those in with people or how do you feel about those different strategies? Yeah. So, so there's a lot of really, really cool stuff, um, about how to, to get as maximally jacked as possible that we can learn from pre-steroid era bodybuilding, uh, is fascinating stuff. So the, most of the guys before Arnold and before steroids were available, right? Um, we know this because this happened in the forties and fifties steroids didn't hit the scene until the late sixties at the earliest, probably in the early seventies. But most of those guys that were winning, uh, the first Mr. Universe and the, some of those early competitions used a ketogenic diet with cyclical mm -hmm. carbohydrate feedings every few days. Uh -huh. So, so by and large, most of them would eat keto for three to five days. And somewhere in those three to five days, they would have an all starch, all carbohydrate based meal as sort of a refeed. Mm -hmm. And that's how they would layer and cycle it in. So it's a really, it's a really great strategy, right? Because, you know, we've also got like some circadian based food things like, uh, you should eat these mm -hmm. foods in the morning and these foods in right. the evening, a lot right. of yin, yin and yang stuff from Chinese medicine that works really well. Mm -hmm. Um, and then there's a lot of things about like not mixing particular macronutrients, right? Like, uh, so one of the, the things they did in the sixties is you, you wouldn't mix, uh, proteins and starches. So you would just save right. your starches and just have it by themselves, uh, mm -hmm. because you'll digest everything better, you know, in that instance. And that's what I like. Um, it, I think it works really well. And, and so what I'll do with, with my competitors, which is for my general population clients is we'll follow that model. and it's a little bit of trial and error because some people need the carbs every three days. Some people need them every five days. Like yeah. myself, for example, when I had to have to cut weight for strongman competitions, I sort of fell into every third day having a one gigantic carb meal. Uh, I did that mm -hmm. by accident. One day we went to Chili's. I had like five bowls of chips and salsa from Chili's. Uh, <laughs> and the next day I was down four pounds. Yeah. So like, all right, let me try this again, see if it works. Did the same thing again, four days later, bam, another two pounds. And it, you know, obviously yeah. I dropped less because I got leaner, but so that, that cyclical every three to five days, there's, there's a lot of really good stuff in there. You know, some people would go every three or some people go every five. Um, yeah, one of the yeah. most successful athletic diets was five days of ketogenic style. And then on the weekends, you have more carbohydrates. See, that's crazy because that was when I was trying so hard to lose that 20 pounds, I had been strict carnivore for two years and I was pissed because I'm like, I'm fasting, I'm carnivore, I'm keto. I'm not, I'm, I've been so good. I haven't touched carbs in two years and I have this <laughs> extra 20 pounds and it was recommended to me to do one day a week of carb cycling. And what I ended up doing was five days a week of keto, two days a week of carb cycling. And that was also part of that process of me dropping that 30 pounds in a month was like, oh, yeah. and it wasn't like pie and cake. And I, it was like <laughs> potatoes, apples, fr you know, fruit, seasonally yeah. appropriate foods. And I yeah. think people are so terrified to do this kind of carb cycling thing. But for me, it's worked well. And it's crazy to hear that that's, that's what <laughs> you see works really well with clients. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and like I said, these were like the pinnacle of muscle mass and performance in the 1950s and 60s, right? Um, wow. It, it worked great. And, and generally I feel like that's pretty sustainable, you know? Yeah, it is. 
I just, I need you to go two to three days and not have any bad, bad quality carbohydrates, not have any starchy, sugary carbohydrates on that third day, take a bowl full of whatever you want, enjoy it. And then boom, we're back on track for the next couple of days. And, you know, it, it doesn't help muscle mass. I think that's where a lot of some of the data becomes a little Mm -hmm. bit conflicting. Like, oh, you don't need carbs to build muscle. Well, that's correct. You don't need a lot of things to build muscle, but those carbs can help you recover from the training, fill up the tank a little bit. So then you can train harder, right? Because if you can't train Mm -hmm. hard, you're not going to make any progress from the training. Um, And then, you know, to make that the ultimate diet, like you said, if you can make that seasonally appropriate carbohydrates, then you're really firing on all cylinders, you know? Yep. I agree. Yeah. Yeah. So, and when you're layering your training in with that too, right? Like you, you can do very low, almost steady state style of training when you're not going to have any carbohydrates. Like that would probably Mm be one of the better, you know, like, all right, I'm going to go two weeks because it's the middle of January and not have any carbs, but I'm not going to hit the weights at all or not going to hit them very hard. You know, there's a whole, there's a whole lot of things you can do to make the system work, but you know, it's like we talked about with the women, like you're just beating yourself into the ground and never refilling the tank or never giving yourself, yep. you know, because you that's can, that's my audience. Right? Like, <laughs> that's who we're talking to. I hope you guys are listening. <laughs> <laughs> Cause you can, you know, I mean, and as you get in better shape, you'll actually utilize those, those carbohydrates, you know, I mean, like mm-hmm. I've, I've heard Dr. Cruz say this before, like a, a well-functioning mitochondria can handle really, really, really crappy food. Yeah. Time to time, right? Probably not all the time. You're going to be right, bad right. mitochondria, but right. you know. So if you're having quality in-season carbohydrates every third day or every fifth day, like you, right. sh- you'll probably thrive on that, and you don't have to feel like you're completely restricting yourself. Or right. you, know, uh, you know, some people love the carnivore thing. Like one of my strongman yeah. guys is, you know, is all about it. Um, yeah. But sadly, it's not working very well for him. And yeah. And it's, it's, an, it's an uphill battle to try to like, all right, we, we, we have to do things a little differently. This is not yeah. working. <laughs> it's, know, like, it's tough because once, you know, and I talk with Rob Wolf about this, once you kind of get into what's working optimally for your body, you have to drop a, the sexy diet name. You know, it's like, I don't have a diet behind what I'm doing. Yeah. There's a few days keto here, maybe throw in some carnivore, then bump in some seasonal carbs there's not a diet name for that. So you don't get to have a trendy name behind what you're doing, but it's, <laughs> it's working optimally for your body. So at the end of the day, who cares it, what, exactly. what it is, um, yeah. but people get so sold on particular dogma and following influencers that are doing specific things, not knowing all the crap that's going on behind the camera and <laughs> the social right. media facade. So yeah, it's, it does a disservice for people. I think when we <laughs> glorify specific you know strategies when they're not working for people right that is probably one of the most important lessons i ever learned from charles is so bruce lee would say you know be water you pour water into a bowl Mm -hmm. it becomes the bowl you pour it into a cup it becomes the cup right you're always you're shaping but but what he you know it was a system of having no system yep take in what works, get rid of what doesn't. And you're left with something that is uniquely your own that works so well. And that's what Charles did with everything. You know, he brought in Chinese medicine, he brought in stuff from the Germans, he brought in stuff from the Soviets, he brought in stuff from everywhere. And then using things like that neurotransmitter test, every person got a very individualized, tailored training progression, training program, dietary recommendations, supplemental protocols, everything you needed based on what you need. You know, somebody might be Mm -hmm high carb, low protein. Somebody might be no carb, high, you know, high protein, but it's all, and we'll get into so many, like the things with the dogma. It's, you know, one person has a system that generally works for the people who gravitate to that system. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. You know, like yeah. you, you try yeah. all these systems, you know, been, being in the business so long now I've seen everything work and I've seen everything not work. Mm-hmm. And, mm-hmm. and so being able to take elements from everything and figuring out why didn't that work and right. what, could, what can work better is how we, we get these systems and, and these individualized things, you know, the system of having no system. It's a, right. it's a powerful thing when you can not fall into this category or that category. 
you know, and you get along with more people and, yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you think less people are idiots and it's just, right. <laughs> it's a way better way to exist when we can all, you know, learn, learn stuff. I agree. And that's, you know, that's been a tough thing for me, kind of moving away from the whole carnivore thing. I still have a lot of friends that are doing carnivore that, you know, do well with it. It helped me tremendously with gut issues. I had really bad IBS. I had a lot of bloating, joint pain, inflammation, and it just got rid of a lot of that stuff. But at the end of the day, I needed to kind of move on and I stuck with it for a lot longer than I had needed to. And it never really did for me what I wanted it to do with the weight loss, you know? And so I think that you can implement these specific strategies at specific times for timelines, but I don't know long-term that it, it, for a lot of people that they need to be doing these things like as their identity, you know, (laughs) That's, that's the danger of it. Yeah. Yeah. And well, like there's a there's a lot of stuff that we see succeed that I think a lot of people don't really understand certain things that go together, right? Like mm-hmm. a ketogenic diet and exercise. There's a there's a specific type of exercise that goes really well with a ketogenic diet. And there's a few types of exercises that don't. And right, you know, it's like same thing with uh, with cold thermogenesis. If you do oh, yeah. a ketogenic type of diet and train this way, and also do cold thermogenesis and are seeing the environment, right. you're going to, you're going to thrive because you're not doing yeah. anything that doesn't go with those systems. Right. But you know, if you're going to do all those things and try to be a, a professional bodybuilder and never be outdoors and do your cold thermogenesis after your muscle building workout, you know, like those are really dumb yeah. combinations. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So there's, there's ways you can make all these things work together and, and not have to do anything to say, like, I love a good steak, but I just, I don't think I want to eat that all the time. Right. You know, right. like, I, I just, I don't think it would, I, I haven't done it, but I've used it with lots of clients. Like, like you said, it, it fixes a lot. I had a guy who had some severe gut issues mm-hmm. that, uh, that couldn't, he was allergic to like the primary ingredients in almost all of the, the fiber powders and, and supplements mm-hmm. that we would normally use to help you know, heal these, these gut issues that he was having like super quick. So, all right, let's pull back and I want you to try this. And, and in, you know, less than a week, you yep. got improvement and two or three weeks later, it's even better. And then it was even better. And then we were yep. done with it, you know, like, all yep. right, we, we neutralized this problem. Let's go back to doing the things a bit more normally where we can train harder or train this way and not have to be restricted. Right. Um, so it's all of these things are, have really great purposes, you know, like yeah, root can be fantastic. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> not exactly. Right. <laughs> yeah, you don't. I'm working on a quantum nutrition course right now, and I've just done the whole module about how sunlight influences our food and how food is a form of light, you know, moving beyond dogma and just understanding UV index here in Georgia is not really going to get above, you know, a certain point where it's food that's grown in strong UV, we shouldn't be eating that. Like you have to yeah. have very strong UV light to grow a banana. Um, you don't really have business eating that in January when that <laughs> you walk outside and that UV light's not available. It's a, it's a circadian mismatch. It's going to cause inflammation in your body, you know, and instead of putting out a specific diet saying, okay, well, but that's, it's paleo. So it's okay. No, <laughs> it's a, it's a circadian mismatch is a confusing signal for your body. And if you continue to do that, you will create mitochondrial issues. And so looking at things in that framework, I think is a lot more empowering than looking at it from the lens of like diet dogma and following the rules of this specific, you know, (laughs) group of people and what they're doing at a particular time. So, yeah. Yeah, Like the, the concept of like light is information. Yes. Is so empowering. I yes. like I, when I learned about all the, you know, chlorophyll A and B and deuterium is more here and more there. Oh, like, yes. oh okay. There's some very cyclical things that are happening here that yep. that have a very broad impact. You know? um, like that's that's one of the, the battles I'm I have to fight very frequently in the in the polyquin circles is mm. carbohydrates at night to help you sleep. And like, yep. so okay, well let's let's talk about what happens with all this, you know, UV centric light that's coming off of this food when it hits your gut, when there's not supposed to be anything happening in your gut, you know, it's like, right. 
Are you getting sleepy from the carbs or are you getting sleepy because you've got shitty insulin management? Exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you know? When I give carbs yeah. to a five-year-old, they tend to have more energy, not less. Right. And exactly. I don't, there's a, there's a dysfunction there where like carbs making you sleepy is a great thing that I don't understand. <laughs> you know? Like, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And there's a whole converse, like you said about deuterium, there's a whole conversation there. That's like a separate rabbit hole, you know, talking with Dr. Boros and understanding that whole spectrum of things, how that plays into our food and behavior. I mean, it, it you just, once you kind of understand those things, it doesn't have to be such a complicated yeah. <laughs> application. Yeah, yeah. That, that stuff is so empowering because it gets you so far beyond just calories in versus calories out. Like, right. You know, when you hear someone say all calories aren't the same, like here's kind of where some of that stuff, oh, like, here's what we mean when we say that, as opposed to, you know, some of the people that don't understand like the deuterium level, it's just like, well, ice cream and protein aren't the same. Like, yeah, but <laughs> it matters why they're not the same. Exactly. Exactly. You know, like, yeah. Talk about why they're not the same. Exactly. Yeah. Well, one more question I had, and we probably should wrap soon, um, is red light therapy and photobiomodulation. How do you use that with your athletes and, and just anybody that you work with? I'm, I love this topic. Uh, so it's one of my favorite things. Um, so we, you have a few different ways you can use it uh, pre-workout and, and post-workout. Um, yeah. Pre-workout, it has a few really cool uh, applications. So just the the perception of the color red in and of itself will raise dopamine pre-training. Um, so having it irradiating some part of your body and being able to see the red light as, you know, you don't have to just stare at it, but that will raise dopamine, uh, which will facilitate, you know, more, a little bit more focus, more training drive. And essentially just irradiating the area that you are going to train between two to five minutes, sometimes a little less, sometimes right around the five minute mark, um, depending on how strong your unit is, right? A, a lot of the research yep. comes from uh, skin on skin laser uh, stuff. So we have to take that into consideration. So you probably need to go a little longer than the 30 seconds that they use on the lasers. But that, mm -hmm. you know, essentially with, with what that does to, to mitochondrial performance and how it upregulates everything in terms of energy production with ATP and the mitochondria, uh, you'll facilitate better performance of that, of that, muscle tissue or the area that's been irradiated. Um, you just want to, the advantage to the panels versus the lasers is that you get to, like, if I'm training my biceps, for example, I can, you know, with the EMR tech panel that I have, I can irradiate my biceps and, you know, I'm not just doing one pinpointed area. Um, right. So we see a, you know, basically a, an improvement in performance and what that'll allow you to do is a couple of different outcomes is you'll essentially either be able to complete more repetitions or be able to lift a slightly heavier weight because of that. And I say slightly heavier, but if you, if you think in terms of, if you could just lift 0.25% heavier because of this and did it every time you train and train three days a week, which is really not that much compared to like what uh, an athlete would train. And you did that every time that you trained that 0.25% is going to add up a lot in, the, in a 12 week program or in the course of uh, six months, 12 months. So that will facilitate a decent amount of, uh, of gains. And Post-workout, what we see is that it attenuates uh, delayed onset muscle soreness, but you have to do it before you're sore. That's mm. where I think a lot of people will use it and say, ah, I didn't really do anything for me. Well, if you're already sore, it's not going to, it's not going to fix it. But if you train, right. do it, and then you're not sore afterwards. So that's where uh, a lot of some of the misconceptions and stuff uh, occur is that the, you have to catch it so that it upregulates the repair mechanisms. But if you're already sore, the damage has set in and then you have, you actually don't want to do it at that point because you're going to uh. not increase the, the decreasing the inflammation at that point is hampering the training response, right? It'd be like ice. Kind of like uh, doing cold therapy after you're exactly. sore is yeah. You want to let it recover naturally, right? Yeah. But if the muscle okay. is, is like, if you just finished training and go do that for another two to five minutes, which is really not that much, right? Uh, you, you're just, it's a concentrated area uh, and right. it, it recovers faster, which, which is essentially facilitating faster repair at that point. Mm -hmm. That's fascinating. See, I, I never knew that. And I'm always like, oh, my back is sore. My neck is sore from holding <laughs> the baby. So I'll go sit in front of my panel, but I never really thought about it in those terms. Yeah. So, so if you could do it, 
uh, I mean, you know, obviously you'd have to be careful with the kid, but if you could do it during right. the act of what you know is going to make you a little sore, you'd probably notice yeah. that it, it helped you a little bit more after that. Interesting. That's fascinating. Wow. Yeah. As, as far as performance, I think that's where the, the most juice is. Um, yeah. Cause there's, you know, there's a lot of stuff where like, ah, oh, that's bullshit or that doesn't work. Or, this doesn't work. And people just not using it correctly. Yeah. Uh, it's, yeah. it's super simple stuff. Two to five minutes, you know, almost, yeah. almost skin on skin. And, uh, and you can reap the benefits of a very short amount of time. That's the thing with red light therapy and cold therapy too, that I, I mean, I, I just yeah. got a forge. So I've got my uh, crazy Morasco forge in the backyard now. Awesome. <laughs> I'm one of those people, <laughs> but it's like jumping back into that. And same thing with red light therapy. You don't need to sit in there for 20 minutes. If you do, you're probably going to mess up your hormones and cause more harm than good. We're not Joe yeah. Rogan here, you know? two minutes at a time and not every single day. And that's the kind of the same thing with red light therapy that I tell people is like, there's a thing called a biphasic dose. Like if you're doing 20 minutes twice a day, you're probably not going to cause harm, but you're probably not going to see results. Would you say? Yeah, exactly. Cause you know, and this is another one of those things that we learned from the research is that the, the more messed up the cell, the bigger, the benefit. You know, so mm, yeah. if you're, if you're just irradiating everything and you don't really have any problems, right. you, you're not, you may not see that big of a benefit of it, you know, but right. if you've got A right. and D or if you've got a, um, like I had a, one of my strongman guys had a biceps tendon tear and, and the Ooh. repair was, you know, you basically stitch it to the bone through the, through the bone. Ooh. And when we had this guy, you know, using sun and DC current and red light and all these things like six weeks ahead of schedule compared to wow. what the docs told him full range lifting again. And, and it was grounding, it was being outside, it was using wow. target targeted red light therapy. But, you know, again, if you're, if, if you're a fairly healthy person, you're not going to see that much benefit from it. So, you, you know, you don't necessarily right. need to, to do that for, for 20 minutes, maybe right. put it, put it on one part of your body for a few minutes and get a big benefit in a small space. Um, but, you know, I mean, as well as I do, like most of the people just need it sort of on in the background to balance some of the mm -hmm. blue light, you know, That's, like you don't yeah. necessarily need to be soaking yourself in this. And, and like with right. the cold, I found the face dunks. Oh, I love those. They're so much more practical. Um, yeah. And I built a really good tan the first year I ever did those, you know, and I mean, you yep. remember how like ginger pale I am. Yeah. <laughs> I was amazed. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> yep. I still have tan lines level. right now in January. My husband's like, what the heck? I'm like, yeah, I just, just all the circadian stuff that I've done. I never had tan lines in my entire life. I'm here yeah. it is January and I still have them from last year. So yeah, <laughs> I, I have maintained a fairly, you know, at least for, for me, I have maintained a yeah, fairly same. decent, fairly decent shade of tan. And, and I remember the first time I did face dunks that winter and, and spring rolled around. Mm -hmm. the, I mean, in three days I had a tan and, you know, I was yep. the, the kind of person before who always got burned, Yeah, you know, same, and, but always wore sunglasses and all, uh, did all that yep. stuff. And, and <laughs> yeah. I mean, just in less than five days, I had a noticeable brown tint to my skin and didn't get burned yep. at all. So it's amazing yep. how, how well this stuff works when you can do things that, that jive together. Exactly. Exactly. Well, I feel like I could probably talk to you for another hour, but my, uh, <laughs> my nanny leaves here in a little bit. So <laughs> what's the best way that people can find you if they want to follow your work and, and maybe even if you've got courses or anything like that available, if they could, uh, kind of find your work. Yeah. So I am, uh, I'm on Instagram. It's uh, Robert C. Jacobs and, uh, I'm an instructor for, uh, for Poliquin group. Uh, our website is poliquinperformance.com and uh, our courses are on the the Poliquin education uh, links to, to Poliquin performance. So the, the courses we teach are mostly uh, uh, strength coach oriented, but we, we do, you know, nutritional courses on hormones and basically how to, how to get rapid performance in, in the least amount of time. Uh, so all our courses are posted there and, and we're going to have a lot of uh, good online content coming up real soon. That's exciting. Well, I'll make sure to link all that in the show notes so people can find that. And uh, thank you so much for being here today, Rob. Hey, thanks for having me. It's good to see you again. Good to see you too.